So continuing on through, uh, through Mark, um, you know, as I've, as I've been kind of studying through the, the first section of Mark, really, over the last few weeks in doing this series, it's, um, you really begin to notice um, the, uh, the opposition that Jesus faces from the Pharisees, that Jesus faces from the Pharisees. We see at the uh, very inception of Jesus' ministry is in the synagogue and they're asking, what is this new doctrine? What's this new doctrine that, they, that we hear? And then later on in chapter 2, we spoke about the healing of the paralytic the other week and Jesus said, um, you know, son, your sins are forgiven you. And he, was, he, was, uh, he just came into conflict, the, the Pharisees saying, this man speaks blasphemy, who can forgive sins but God alone? And then just one occasion after the other, one time after the other, we see this opposing... Um, pharisaical uh, um, uh, idea that's going on really this opposition that Jesus is facing and we come to our uh, verse today verse 23 the end of chapter 2 and into chapter 3 and we see this picture of Jesus on his, mi on his ministry and walking through the grain fields and his disciples are plucking the heads of corn as they go and again he's challenged by the Pharisees and then we see in our, our second Sabbath uh, encounter, he heals this man with a withered hand and they challenge him again. They, they um, challenge him and accuse him of working on the Sabbath. In today's text, we really see two examples of the Pharisees coming once again into conflict with Christ. The Pharisees, instead of obeying the law of God, actually they usurp the law uh, of God with their own extra biblical traditions. And... Uh, we see these dialogues of conflict taking place between the Pharisees criticizing and accusing Jesus, chapter 3, verse 2. Uh, and again, they, um, Jesus takes this opportunity to expose really the hardness of their hearts, showing that these burdensome traditions, this faulty, loveless interpretation of the Sabbath law is actually diametrically opposed to the spirit of the law, the spirit of the fourth commandment, that is the Sabbath that God made for man. And not man, uh, and not man for the Sabbath. You see, the Sabbath was given for the goodness and the wholeness of man. Jesus said to them in chapter three, verse four, "Is it not lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill?" They should have known this as the people of God. They should have known the answer to this, but they remained, they remained silent, and their silence was deafening, exposing the hardness of their hearts these pharisees these hard-hearted pharisees jesus in chapter 2 when he healed the paralytic he said he saw their hearts that they reasoned within themselves and again we see in uh, chapter 3 verse 5 that he was angered he was grieved by the hardness of their hearts they didn't have in mind the the um the things of god but instead they had in mind the things of men. Just three points really this morning as we just look at our, our two kind of encounters here that Jesus has with these Pharisees. Firstly, uh, a hypocritical legalism to be exposed by the truth of the king. A hypocritical legalism which is exposed by the truth of the king. Secondly, a loveless legalism to be dealt with by love. To be dealt with by love. A loveless legalism to be dealt with by love and then thirdly a true rest the only true rest that can be found in Christ the only true rest that can be found in Christ so firstly a hypocritical legalism to be exposed by the truth of the king the Pharisees the hypocrites Jesus says you go through the, the, the Gospels I think it's 21 occasions Jesus either uses the term hypocrite or hypocrites in the context of the Pharisees. In fact, if you've ever been through Matthew chapter 23, you see this uh, dialogue of Jesus, you hypocrites, you whitewashed tombs, you hypocrites. You... I mean, every other verse, he's basically calling these guys out. Jesus, he didn't pull any punches when he needed, when he, when he needed to, you know. He was a, a preacher that preached righteousness. He called sinners out for their sin. And, and, and least of all these Pharisaical, um, Hypocritical, legalistic Pharisees. 
There's another example. You remember in Luke chapter 13, this is later on, Jesus heals the lady who's been bent over for, I think it's 18 years, and he heals her, and immediately she was made straight, and they glorified God. In Luke chapter 13, verse 14, it says, But then the ruler of the synagogue, he answered Jesus with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, and he said to the crowd, There are six days which men ought to work, Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. And Jesus responded, he answered this man, he said, You hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from a stall and lead it away to the water in order to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has had bound for 18 years, ought not she to be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? When he said these things, his adversaries were put to shame. So what's going on here? We, we have a legalistic, hypocritical um, view. These Pharisees, they were, they were hypocrites. What does it mean to be a hypocrite? Well, the idea of the word hypocrite means to put on a mask. It's kind of a word that used to be used in ancient times of those who would do like stage shows and they'd put these masks on and they would augment their voice. They're trying to be something externally different to that which, what, which they are internally. It's putting on a show, it's putting on a face. Have you ever heard of that expression, uh, you can't judge a book by its cover? You know, sometimes you see a book, the cover of a book, and you think, oh, this is going to be amazing, it's about this, it's about that, and then you start to read and you think, actually, the cover, you know, it's, it's different to the inside of the book. And this idea of hypocrisy, putting on a mask, it's a, a dissembler of ideas, someone who dissembles ideas and words which contradict their inward thoughts. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were externally uh, being someone that they weren't internally. This idea of whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones, Jesus, that's the way he described these Pharisees whitewashed tombs they're, they're making themselves to, uh, to be seen before men on the outside as something special something very religious something very pious yet inwardly they're full of dead men's bones and this is very strong language we see this example in Luke chapter 18 of the tax collector and the, and the Pharisee that come to before God and they come to pray to God and the Pharisee he comes and he, and he prays, two men went up to the temple, he stood and he prayed thus within himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, I thank you that I'm not an extortioner, I thank you that I'm not unjust, I'm not an adulterer, and I'm not even as this tax collector is here, but I fast twice a week, I, I give all my tithes and all that I possess. This man was a Pharisee, he, he thought that his relationship with God was based upon what he did, the things that he did, he's going to his pious, self-righteous works. But the tax collector standing afar off, he said that he wouldn't even raise his, his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breasts, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the word tells us that this tax collector, who humbled himself before God, he saw himself rightly before God, he went away justified. But the, tax collector, but the Pharisee was still under the condemnation of God. Now, when we talk about hypocrisy and, try and being something before men that we're not inwardly, we must be careful that, I mean, each one of us here, we, we do act differently around different people. You know, there's certain things that you do at home with your wife or your husband or your children that you wouldn't come in to church to do. If you came into church today, I mean, we're pretty, pretty casual in here anyway, but if you, if you kind of took your shoes and socks off and you cracked open a can of Coke and kind of sat with your feet on the chairs, you know, kind of scratching your head or, you know, whatever, whatever we do around our families or in private, um, you know, that's different. There's, there's a social etiquette that, that we have. We, we do operate differently around different people, but that's not really what we're talking about here when we're, when we're talking of hypocrisy, S certainly when it comes to religious hypocrisy. There was something very dangerous that was going on here. These were supposed to be the religious folk, the religious leaders teaching the others and Jesus described them as blind leaders of the blind into a ditch. Blind leaders of the blind into a ditch. We, we think about the, the, this pharisaical hypocrisy, this religious external hypocrisy. We, we think about the idea of someone trying to put on a religious veneer, a religious show to those around them. 
but inwardly they're, they're dead before God. Inwardly they're corrupt, they're putrid, they're, they're rotten dead men's bones before God. And we can see this in the world around us today. We can see this with various religious groups, even at much of what calls itself Christian. They can have a religious veneer externally, but inwardly they're as lost as lost can be. They're as, they're as far from God as can be possible. But I want us just to talk and think at the, at the moment, we've, we've seen this kind of religious hypocrisy, but what about, the, what about like an, a, a worldly hypocrisy? Have you, ever heard, have you ever heard people say, well, I don't want to come to church because Christians are just full of, um, churches are just full of hypocrites. Christians are just hypocrites. And there's a sense in which that might be partly true. Many professing Christians are probably fairly hypocritical. But the reality is the whole world, anyone outside of Christ really, is living with a mask living in a hypocritical way even the atheist there's a kind of there's almost like an inverted hypocrisy with atheism you see the atheist is not trying to put on some religious veneer to fool other people and then inwardly being um, doing something or living in a different way but the atheist internally has a knowledge of God but they externally they, they, they um, suppress that knowledge. They, they denounce that, that, that God exists. Let me explain it. So the atheist will wake up in the morning and they'll look at their children and they'll believe that their children have value and meaning and worth and dignity and that life is meaningful and that there's purpose to life. They'll have that inward knowledge because they're image bearers of God. Whether they believe in God or not doesn't take them away from the fact that they're image bearers of God. They'll go outside and if someone steals their wallet, they will know that that is wrong to do that, that stealing is wrong. They have a, an inward, inbuilt reality when it comes to truth, when it comes to moral objectivity, right and wrong. But yet they suppress that truth and they profess that God doesn't exist. They profess that these things that are necessary uh, you see, God is the necessary precondition for all of these realities that the, within the world in which they live. You cannot have objective morality without the existence of God. You cannot have truth without the existence of God. You cannot have right and wrong without the existence of God. So the atheist, in a sense, has this inverted hypocrisy. They, they live in God's world whether they like it or not. Everybody lives in God's world whether that person likes it or not, but then they reject the existence of God externally. They're living as a hypocrite with this mask that needs to be removed. Living a life in deception. So it's not just the religious folks that can be hypocritical. It's the atheists, it's the secular community, it's, it's, it's human beings in general before coming to Jesus and having that mask taken away. Having that mask removed, for those of us in here that know the Lord, you'll know that at conversion, at conversion you start to see things differently. When the Lord removes that, that moral facade, he removes that mask, he removes that hypocrisy, he takes it away, he shows us who we are, shows us what we are at our core, but then he shows us what he's done for us in Christ. That hypocrisy needs to be removed we need to be a people who aren't playing games with God. And my hope and prayer for this church really is that, that we're transparent before God. That we would be a people who are transparent. That we wouldn't be playing games, religious, pious games. There's a lot of churches where you can go in and you can just play the game. You can say all the right things. You can have Christian form in your speech. You can pray with form. You can do this, do that and the other. But, uh, but their hearts could be as far from God as anybody. My prayer is that we have transparency before God. Now obviously, what I'm, I'm not saying that we need to be kind of constantly just sharing everything about ourselves with everyone. There's a time and a place to be wise and, and whatnot. But before God, let us be a people who are genuine, that are, that are walking in, ge in a, genuine, um, a genuine walk with the Lord before him, before one another as his church. Let's not play games with God. Let's not be like the hypocrites. Let us realize that it's only through Christ that we can be forgiven, that this hypocrisy can be removed. So how does Jesus expose this hypocrisy? Well, this legalistic, 
Um, this hip hypocritical legalism, it's exposed really with the truth. It's exposed with the truth. Let's just look at our text for a moment. Uh, we go back, they're, they're picking the grain. The Pharisees challenge him in verse 24 of chapter 2. They say, why are they doing what it's not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, have you never read? Have you never read? He goes to the word of God. He goes to the truth. You know, the truth is the best way to expose hypocrisy. It's the best way to expose deception is to know the truth. When I used to be, some of you may know this, I used to be, in, in, when I was training as a police officer, they, back in 2004, 2005, in our training, one of the things they said was, there's two things that are a great deterrent for burglars. The first thing is dogs. Dogs are a great deterrent for burglars. The second thing is light, a light. And you have a security light. Burglars don't like dogs and they don't like lights. And I found that quite interesting to, to see light, you know, when evil's taking place and light comes in on that evil, that evil goes, it has to go, it has to be dealt with. And the evil of hypocrisy, self-righteousness, when the light of God's word is shone upon that evil, it has to, it is exposed for what it is, it has to go, it has to change. Jesus came and he brought the light of God's word down upon these Pharisees. Have you never read? Have you never read? Now it's interesting, just as a side note, Jesus is the living word. He's the one who is the word of God. There are times in the scriptures like the Beatitudes when he says, you have heard it, you have heard it said of old, you've, seen, you've heard it written of old, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, but I say unto you, and he gives them the deeper principle of the law. Jesus has, he comes with his own authority as the living word. He can speak. He doesn't speak as the prophets. He doesn't say, thus saith the Lord. He says, I say unto you, because he is the Lord. He is God. But here he, cho he chooses to use the scriptures. He chooses to use the scriptures. Now it's interesting. He could have gone to, in this particular example, they're, they're plucking grains of corn from the fields. They actually, what, what's interesting is they actually weren't breaking the law of the Sabbath. He could have gone to Leviticus 23, Deuteronomy 23, which talks about when you reap a harvest in your land, uh, you shall not reap the corners of the field when you reap, uh, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And then the miscellaneous laws in Deuteronomy 23, when you come into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes at your pleasure, but you shall not put any into a container. When you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hands, but you shall not use a sickle in order to harvest the grain. You see, they weren't breaking the law. As a matter of fact, they were actually just doing the, what Moses, um, the instruction to, to, that had been given to Moses concerning um, what people were to do with these fields and the fact that strangers or those who were poor could come and glean uh, from the edges of these fields. But you know, Jesus didn't go to these, he didn't go to Leviticus 23, he didn't go to Deuteronomy 23, but he went to 1 Samuel 21. He went to 1 Samuel 21. This is a passage about a king and I don't think this is coincidental. I don't think Jesus went to 1 Samuel 21 to speak of King David. I don't think it was coincidental. Verse 26, sorry, verse 25, have you never read what David did? This type of Christ, this king that was from, that Christ himself was from the lineage of David. Have you never read what he did when he was in need and hungry and those who were with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiath the high priest and he ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests and also gave some to those who were with him. Jesus here speaking of David when he was on the run from Saul, um, he goes to uh, uh, the, the land of uh, Nob and he speaks with the priest. In, in the account in 1 Samuel 21, it's actually uh, Ahimelech who's Abiathar's dad that David speaks with, but Jesus speaks of Abiathar, he says in the days of Abiathar, in the, t in the days of Abiathar, because Abiathar was more well known among, um, among the Jews of his day as one of David's chief supporters. 
So Jesus wasn't getting it wrong here when he was saying about Abiathar, but Abiathar was um, Ahimelech's son, who also was a high priest. But we see this picture of David on his mission, that David the king on his mission with his men, taking this bread that was lawful to eat. And we see this parallel of Christ the king on this mission with his men, going through the field and taking, plucking the heads of grain, these that are lawful to eat. Christ pointing them to the fact that there's this a reality, that there's this greater king than David who stands before them. This one who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And then he says in verse 28, Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And we spoke about this the other day, Jesus using this title, the Son of Man. He used that when he, when he healed the paralytic. Remember he said the Son of Man so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, I say unto you, take up your bed and walk. Now this term, Son of Man, as I mentioned the other week, it's more than just an allusion towards his human nature. When Jesus uses this ter term, Son of Man, in fact, it's, as I mentioned the other week, it's, it's used uh, around about 87 times uh, in the New Testament. And it's, the, it's the, the, the most common way that Jesus refers to himself. And really he's looking back to the, the, the scriptures, the Old Testament passages, uh, Daniel chapter 7, this one who is the son of man, who's given a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his, and his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. Jesus is using this language specifically here. He's pointing them back to David the king. He's telling them the son of man is the one who is the Lord of the Sabbath. Again, this term, the Lord of the Sabbath. Christ is the one with all authority. He has this divine authority. He's the creator. He's the one, he's the one when we say things like the Lord of the Sabbath, we would need to realize Jesus is the one who created the Sabbath. He's the one who made the world. He and the Father and the Spirit made the world in six days and they instituted this day of the Sabbath rest. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He owns the Sabbath. He owns the weekly cycle. He owns the Pharisees that he was talking to. He owns this world. He owns this universe. And he's, coming, he's bringing his Lordship down to bear upon this situation. He's bringing his Lordship down to bear upon these Pharisees. He says he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the one who owns this Sabbath. It's his Sabbath, it's his bread, it's his corn. These are his disciples, it's his universe. He owns it all. He owns it all. You see, this hypocrisy is dealt with by the truth. It's the truth that exposes the legalistic hypocrisy. But it needs to be truth that we come under the authority of. We need to come under the authority of the truth of God. You see, these Pharisees, that was their issue, really. Not just that they, they didn't know the truth. I mean, they knew a lot of truth, but they weren't under the authority of God. They weren't under the authority of Christ. Jesus says in John chapter 5, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. He's speaking to the Pharisees. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. See, that was their problem. Their problem wasn't a lack of truth. I mean, some of these guys, you look at the Apostle Paul. He was from a different sect of Pharisees, but ultimately he knew more truth than most people. But he was unprepared. He was unprepared to come to Christ. He was unprepared to come to God. We're called to submit to God. If we want to see hypocrisy exposed in our uh, dealt with in our lives, if we if we have legalistic tendencies, we stray in towards self righteousness. We stray in towards legalism. We need to submit ourselves to God. We need to come to God on His terms. James chapter four says, "Submit to God," and we're called to submit to God. The, the authority in our lives should be the word of God. Now there may be times where we, we come face to face, we're confronted face to face with something in scripture which 
which we know is in contrast to our lives, which we know is, is, is opposed to um, what's something that we're doing, some sin that has been, uh, that's not being dealt with. But we need to yield our lives to God and to his will. Jesus brought down his lordship to bear upon these Pharisees. They were questioning him about what, the, what his disciples were doing. And he said, he is the king. He is the Lord. He is the one who's in control. This Sabbath was made for man, for the wholeness of man, for the provision of man, and not man for the Sabbath. So this hypocrisy is exposed and dealt with by truth of this king, the authority of this truth. Now let's just look at our second point. A loveless, a loveless legalism to be dealt with by love. A loveless legalism to be dealt with by love. So we move now into our chapter 3, into our second Sabbath. Chapter 3. We see this man with the withered hand. And then in verse 2, they watched him, they watched Jesus closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. I mean, that's, that's, that amazes me to think that they didn't watch him in awe, with expectancy, hoping this man would be healed. They, they actually wanted Jesus to heal this man. Not, not so that the man would be healed, not because they had love for this man, but so they could accuse him. I mean, that is, how, how hard would your, does your heart have to be to actually want to see a miracle so that you can accuse the miracle worker, that you can accuse the one who's doing this miracle? This idea um, that they may accuse him, this ver uh, verse 2, this word in verse 2, accuse, comes from a Greek, the Greek root word, a categorio, which means to bring charges or to seek to bring a legal case against someone. And we often see this with, with hard-hearted people, with legalistic people. They're very often not even concerned about the outcome. They're just concerned about whether it, it falls into their, uh, it, the, as to whether the outcome suits their agenda. They couldn't care less if this man was healed. They couldn't care less about the, the welfare or the wholeness of this man with the withered hand. All they wanted to see was Jesus to be accused. They were coming against Christ himself. You see this with people with a critical spirit. You see it with religious people. They're constantly criticizing other people. You see this religious spirit at work. It often happens with people who struggle with theological pride. You see a critical spirit began to be, be, begins to be bred within them. They start putting others down and they're almost, it's almost like a sense of purpose, a sense of fulfillment in just dragging other people down before them. And they lose perspective on what God has called us to be and who God has called us to be. Secondly, we see um, Jesus challenges them. It's interesting, isn't it, in verse 3, Jesus actually sets this whole thing up. He calls the man to step forward. It's not like Jesus was taken by surprise. It wasn't like he's teaching and then the man with the withered hand turns up and, set, and kind of asks him, can you heal me? And Jesus is put on the spot, so he does this miracle on the Sabbath. That's not what happened here. Jesus said to the man, step forward. He's setting this whole thing up on the Sabbath. He's not just responding to him, but he's setting the whole thing up. He calls him to step forward in verse 3. And then he said to them, he said to the Pharisees, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? And remember we spoke in, in when, uh, the other week about when the paralytic came. And Jesus often uses this... Uh, this, this um, principle of questioning in order to, in order, in a sense, to expose what's in the hearts of men and women. Do you remember when he said, what is it easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven you or for, to take up your bed and walk. He gives them this ultimatum. And here he does a similar kind of thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Very simple. A child could say, to do good, to save life, surely. And what was their response? Silence. Complete silence. As I said a minute, just a little bit earlier, the silence here was deafening. It was deafening and it, and it exposed a deep-rooted issue in their hearts. They were more concerned about 
obeying the letter of the law than the spirit of the law, the spirit in which the law was given. So what was the response? Well, he healed this man, stretched out his hand. This was, again, just as a side note, this wasn't just some little, as, as so often with Jesus' miracles, it's not just some little trick, some little psychosomatic charlatan's trick, but he actually, this man with the withered hand, you think about the power of Jesus at work, his hand straightened. It was a, it was a perfect, immediate miracle before everyone who was there to see. And what was their response? They went out, the Pharisees went out, verse 6, and immediately plotted with, with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. That's very significant. And it really exposes the true spirit that is behind the, these Pharisees. They went out and they plotted with the Herodians. This is the first place that Herodians are met, is mentioned in the scriptures. The Herodians were supporters and associates of Herod of Antipas of Galilee. It was a Herodian political party and ultimately Herodians were siding with Rome. Now often the Pharisees and the Herodians didn't see eye to eye over certain things concerning the politics of, of uh, Jerusalem, the politics of the Jews, but the Pharisees there was, there was always one thing that the Pharisees and the Herodians saw eye to eye on, and that was the destruction of Jesus. They linked together the spirit of this age. These Pharisees were of the spirit of this age. They weren't operating under the spirit of God. Many scholars believe that the, the Herodians um, believed to be Herod, uh, believed Herod to be some kind of Messiah or saviour of sorts, that he was going to bring the Jewish land into favour with the Romans and that they would bring and receive blessing as a consequence. But Jesus Christ came the true Messiah and, and gave the true blessing to his people. You see, the Pharisees were really showing here their indifference, their hardness of heart. And often when a person is pushed, even a person who professes to be Christian, and they're not truly saved, when they're pushed to the core of what they are in, their, in the very core of their heart, you often see actually they're just of the spirit of the world. Sometimes, if for anyone who's been out doing evangelism and preaching, sometimes you engage with people who, are, who profess to be Christians. I, I remember one occasion in Starbridge we were preaching and there was a crowd of these young guys and they were swearing and shouting and you're, you're, you're this and you're that and you shouldn't be this. And there was this young girl and, and she said, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Uh, and then, you know, the conversation developed and, and she said, you shouldn't be doing this. This is not how it should be done. You shouldn't be out here in the street. You're, you're giving Jesus a bad name. You're putting everybody off. You know, the usual kind of comments from some of these characters. And eventually, as the day, as the afternoon kind of panned out, there was some very, and I'm not even going to say it from this pulpit, but there was some very vile behaviours that were going on in front of us. And she was there with them laughing and, and revelling in sin. And, and it really exposed what was in this girl's heart. She wasn't a Christian. She professed to know Jesus with her mouth, but she had a heart that was fallen. I, I pray for her. I don't say that in any judgment over her. I pray for her. But what, what the point I'm trying to make is when a person is pushed on the truth of God, you begin to see what is truly within them. You begin to see this, this uh, spirit of the age that is at work within them. Even religious people who profess to know Jesus but haven't truly been born again. The Bible says that, that you're, you're either a slave to sin, you're either in the, in, the, in the kingdom of darkness, having been taken captive by Satan to do his will, according to the scriptures, or you're a bondservant of Jesus Christ. You've been pulled from darkness into his marvellous light. And you now walk to the beat of a different drummer. You now walk opposed to the things of this world. Not conformed to the world, as Paul says, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. By the renewing of our minds. See, the Pharisees were constantly showing their legalistic in different hard hearts. They didn't care about the Sabbath ultimately. And the reason why that was exposed is because they didn't even care about the ones who the Sabbath was given for. 
the Sabbath was given for man and not man for the Sabbath. They were so concerned about their religious traditions and their pious practices, they were more concerned of those pious practices than they were concerned about the souls of men around them. They were trying to usurp the spirit of the law by the letter of the law and Christ exposed this. They were claiming that Christ was breaking the law because they believed that he was working on the Sabbath by doing these miracles. But Christ never broke the law. Christ has never broken the law because Christ is the holy and righteous one from heaven. But he obeyed and fulfilled the spirit in which the law was given. Let me, let me just try and put it like this. If you, were, if you were walking down a beach, let's say you're on holiday. Um, it wouldn't happen in England. Let's say you're in Australia, you're on holiday. You're walking down this beach on your own and you see a sign in the sand. It says, no swimming, shark attack or no swimming, shark attacks. You think, okay, I'm not going to go swimming. Sharks attack here. You walk down the beach, 100 metres down the beach, you see a man about 30, 40 metres out, and he's been attacked by a shark. He's been swimming, he's been attacked. And he's crying for help. He's saying, help me, I'm, I'm going to drown, I can't get out on my own, I've been attacked by a shark, help me. And you turn around and say, sorry mate, I, no swimming. You know, there's a sign back there, so there's a shark attack, no swimming. Right, that sign was given for the benefit of man, it was given for man's uh, wholeness. But there's times where you have to get in the water and you have to get that man out. This is what Jesus was doing, he came and he healed men. The spirit of the law of that sign was no swimming because it's dangerous. But to obey, to place the letter of the law over the spirit of the law, which is what they were doing here, was actually destroying what the law was given for. Does that make sense? I mean, it's not a great, it's not a perfect illustration of the Sabbath, but Jesus came and he healed mankind on this Sabbath. He wasn't breaking the Sabbath. He was doing, he was obeying the spirit of the law uh, that was given here. You see, these Pharisees were polishing up the outside of their lives, as we were talking earlier. Jesus uses this expression, uh, you know, they strain, they strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. I don't know if you've heard that before in the scriptures, Matthew 23. So when they used to have water and wine, some, in, in, Jewish, um, in Jewish law it was, it was uh, forbidden, it was prohibited to have any kind of winged insect. If you ate an insect that didn't have joints in its legs, then it would be considered unclean. So these guys, they used to get strainers and they would strain the water for insects, they would strain wa uh, insects out of their water and out of their wine so that they didn't accidentally swallow a gnat, they didn't accidentally swallow this, um, this insect. But yet Jesus said, you strain out gnats and you swallow a camel. That's actually quite an interesting point, isn't it? He's, he's being almost, there's almost an air of, of uh, sarcasm in that, uh, almost an air of humour in a sense, but he's basically making the point that you, you, you know, you, you're hypercritical over the areas and then you miss the whole point. You miss the whole point of what this law was given for. He says, is it lawful to do good and to, or to do evil? And they couldn't answer him. They couldn't answer him because they'd developed their own little systems and they'd missed the bigger picture. They'd missed the reality of the royal the royal law of love that the Bible teaches. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment and the second is like, like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So it's love. It's love that God requires, God is love, he requires love from us. Not, I'm, not, I'm not advocating lawlessness here, please don't say that we haven't been, we've, we have a law to obey as Christians, we want to be law abiding people, um, but you know it's love that causes us to come away from this critical way around others, it's love that causes us to have our, our own self-righteousness dealt with. 
when we see the love of God that he has poured out in our hearts, when we see the love of God that's been demonstrated towards us in Jesus Christ, that's where the chains of self-righteousness are broken. Love comes from God. And love is powerful. You know, grace is powerful. The grace of God, the love of God in Jesus Christ is powerful to break the chains of self-righteousness. It's powerful to rip off the mask of hypocrisy. And it's only when that has happened that we can truly love others as we should. And we can only truly love God as we should uh, when that takes place. You see, the Apostle Paul himself was one who was a Pharisee, again from a different sect. He was one who was perfect regarding the law, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. But he was still dead in sin until he met with Jesus, until he understood that his sins had been dealt with at Calvary, that he, that he couldn't be saved by keeping the law. And we see, you read through Galatians, he's constantly writing to the churches, these, the law, law keeping won't save you. It's only Christ that can save. It's only Christ that can save. And there's power in that. There's power in the grace of God. There's power in the cross of Jesus Christ and the shed blood for sinners like us. If you have an issue with criticizing people, if you have a problem with pulling others down, there's only one solution Christ. You come to the cross. There's no boasting. When we come before Jesus, we come before the cross. We cannot boast in our own accomplishments. We cannot boast in our own achievements. And that, that was the issue here with the Pharisees. They, they thought that they could earn heaven. They thought they could do it in their own strength. But they hadn't come to Christ. They hadn't been set free. They hadn't received the love of God shed abroad in their hearts. And that's why this critical, legalistic hypocrisy was still there. And then finally now, just a shorter point, true rest can only be found in Christ. True rest can only be found in Jesus. You see, every human being, even the atheist, even the, the Muslim, even the, the Buddhist, every human being, whether it's a self-righteous religious system or a secular atheistic system, every human being has this nagging, this nagging issue within them that they need to get right with God. Sometimes it's quieter, sometimes it's louder. But everyone in them, everyone who lives in this world has this nagging concern for their soul. Then na a nagging concern to find rest. And they look for all kinds of things to find rest. Uh, whether it's um, money or a good job or whatever it may be, they try to find their contentment, contentment in all these different things. But the only way that true rest can be found is in this Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Again, when we think about this term, the Lord of the Sabbath, we think about Christ, the one who's the firstborn over all creation, the one who by him all things were created, things which are in heaven, things which are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities, or powers. You see, the Sabbath wasn't instituted just by Moses, but it was, in, it was instituted by God. God instituted this Sabbath. But, what, but why? Why was the Sabbath given? Now, um, Stuart last week spoke a little bit about the Sabbath day, didn't he? Was it because God had made the world in six days and then he, he was tired, he just wanted to take a rest? Well, no, we know that God is limitless in his power. He doesn't get tired. Is it for our benefit? Is it so that we can have a day of rest before God? Well, there's a sense in which that's partly true. There's a, there's a, there's a real privilege and there's, a, there's something to be said in taking that rest and worshipping God on that day. But really the Sabbath was instituted as a picture of Christ, the rest that was going to be coming in Christ, the rest that can only be found in Christ. He gave the Sabbath uh, from, from the seventh day going forward and then instituted it through Moses. He said it's, for, it's a sign between me and you throughout your generation that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath therefore for it is holy to you. 
everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. Now this was pretty serious. You know, anyone who, who profaned the Sabbath in the Old Testament would be put to death. When Jesus was doing these miracles, there was a lot that was at stake here. There was a lot that was going on according to the, the Jewish Old Testament covenant people. But Christ, you see, is this Sabbath day rest. Christ is this rest that we can find. This same Apostle Paul that would have kept the Sabbath to a, to a T after he was converted says in Colossians 2, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath which are a shadow of things to come but the substance is of Christ. Hebrews chapter 4, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. You see, the Apostle Paul says that this rest, this Sabbath, the substance of this Sabbath is found in Christ. And Christ is the only way that mankind can truly find rest for their souls. We see this picture here of the man with the withered hand. We see this, um, this healing that took place. He was made whole. He was healed by God. But you know, there's a deeper healing that men need. And that is a healing of the soul. A healing that can only be found in Jesus Christ. We speak about rest. The only time that rest will be found, true spiritual rest, is in Christ. Do you know the Bible says that there is a real hell? And I was thinking about the idea of rest over the last few days. In Revelation chapter 14, it speaks of the wine of the fury of God's wrath, which is poured out in full strength into the cup of indignation. Those who will be tempted, uh, sorry, tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And, they, and this is what kind of caught my attention these last few days and they have no rest day or night do you know hell there will be no rest in hell I mean we can we can get rest today in a sense physically and we know that we find our spiritual rest in Christ but there's no spiritual rest in hell there's no physical rest in hell it's complete turmoil it's complete destruction for eternity I mean, we can't even get our minds around what that, what that will be for people amongst many other things in hell, but there's no rest. You ever, you ever heard this expression when someone dies? Well, uh, R.I.P., rest in peace. Well, that's just not true if they're not Christian. If, if they die and they're not Christian, there is no rest. There's no resting in peace for those who die in their sin but only for those who die in Christ, because Christ is that rest. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, came from heaven and he walked amongst us in the flesh and he challenged these individuals that didn't know God. They were outwardly doing all this religious stuff, but inwardly they were as dead as dead can be. They had no rest. They wanted to accuse him, they wanted to destroy him. And there are multitudes of people all over this world today that don't have any rest. They're in turmoil, they're, they're, they're at enmity with God, they're kicking against the truth of God, they're living lives as hypocrites before him. But it's only in Christ can that mask of, of legalism, that mask of hip, hip, hypocrisy be, be stripped from us to be removed. As Christ Jesus came and he lived that perfect life, and he went to his death on the cross at Calvary. And it was upon that cross where Jesus took the punishment that we deserve for our hypocrisy. We deserve the punishment of God for our legalistic, uh, religious um, legalism that we have. Each one of us, even when you become Christian, you still, there's still heirs of the flesh that are working within us. We still struggle with um, legalism from time to time. It still claws away at the flesh. We need to continually come to Christ 
We need to, re- we need to come to him and recognise it's only in him that we can re- receive this forgiveness, that we can be made right with God. Jesus Christ, this King, this King of the Word, the Word becoming flesh and dwelling amongst us, He's the one with all authority in heaven and earth, and He calls us to submit to Him today, to submit to Him. Oh, I just pray and hope that we wouldn't just be a bunch of guys who are doing legalistic stuff and come in and go through the motions of the traditions of Christianity, but that we would have a living faith with this Saviour. Jesus Christ would we come to him today would we lay down the mask of hypocrisy would we lay down the legalism and would we find our rest only in him and in him alone amen I'm just going to pray and then we'll sing our final hymn Father, we, we do thank you, Lord, for your, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Lord of the Sabbath, the one in whom we can have that true rest for our souls. Lord, forgive us when we, when we try to develop our own systems of religion, when we go to the left and to the right. We go our own way in order to in order to satisfy our religious conscience, Lord, and instead of coming to you. Jesus, we just pray that we would be a people that would live close to you. Thank you that you care, that you cared enough to heal this man's withered hand on the Sabbath, showing the greater law of love towards one another. Thank you that you cared and your disciples were fed as they walked through that field. We pray, Lord, that you would feed us today. We pray, Lord, that we wouldn't stand silent when you ask, what is it better to do, good or evil? Pray, Lord, that we would cry out, good, to save life. Lord God, we ask that you'd transform our minds, that you would wash us, In your word, we pray that we would be a people who would submit to the authority of your word. That we would yield our lives to your will, Lord. And that you would have your way in amongst us. We pray for our week ahead, Lord, that you would be with us. That you would lead us and guide us, Lord. Guard our hearts from the evil one. Guard our minds, Lord, from legalism. From self-righteousness. We know that these things often try and creep in. Pray, Lord, that we would live close to the cross. We thank you, Jesus, that you are in heaven and that you are reigning over all creation. And we just commit our time to you now. Pray that you protect us, Lord. Guard our hearts from the the, the one who tries to steal the seed of your word. Anything that's not been of you today, Lord, I pray that it would fall to the ground and die, but all that's been of you, I pray, would bear much fruit within us. In Jesus' precious name and for your glory. Amen.